This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. The views expressed by guests on this program do not necessarily represent the views of the host or owners of the Doggy Diva Show and do not necessarily constitute endorsement of products. Medical information discussed by guests on this program are those of the guests and is only for informational purposes and should not replace medical advice by your local veterinarian professional. Hi, this is Susan Marie from the Doggy Diva Show. On our show this week, human meds that are toxic for our pets and some things you need to know when starting a rescue. Then, choosing a groomer that is right for you and your pet. That's what's on our show this week. Let's get to it. Hey, did you hear that? What is that? It's the bark heard round the world. The Doggy Diva Show. Here's Susan Marie. Hi, welcome to the Doggy Diva Show, the show for animal lovers. I'm your host, Susan Marie, and as always, I'm joined by my canine co-hosts, the Doggy Divas themselves, Francesca, Coco, and our newest little diva, Miss Olive. Miss Olive is the cute little Italian greyhound rescue in the picture with the microphone. Thank you for joining us today as we bring the experts in the pet and animal world right to you. So go grab a cup of coffee and your pet's favorite treat, and we'll be back in just a moment. Tired of wasting money on giant bags, boxes, and jugs of litter that don't last? Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter that lets you use less and get more. World's Best Cat Litter uses the concentrated power of corn to deliver outstanding odor control and easy cleanup. It's lightweight, 99% dust-free, and pet, people, and planet-friendly. It's even flushable. Make the switch to World's Best Cat Litter and save $2. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hey, Monica. You know, there's so many medications out there that us humans take that are really not good for our pets. What Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because they could be actually lethal and poisonous. Absolutely. So Pet Poison Helpline, more than 50% of their toxicity calls are due to pets that have, you know, gotten into human medication, whether they've actually, you know, dropped the medication and they pick up just one or, you know, things have been knocked off the counter or the pet actually chews the bottle up. You know, no matter what the situation is, um, they've had a very, very large amount of calls um, and pets that have become very, very ill, unfortunately, due to some of our human medications. So the top 10 medications that the Pet Poison Helpline sees um, that are extremely toxic and have a large number of cases on um, for humans are um, the top one being NSAIDs. Our Advils, our Aleve, our Motrins, our non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, the number two, shortly followed up by that, is our Tylenols. Um, the third one is our antidepressants, um, Effexor, Cymbalta, Prozac, Lexapro, um, followed by our ADD, ADHD medications. Our sleeping aids, uh, Xanax, Clonopin, Ambien, Lunesta, and then also birth control um, pills, progesterone, um, estrogen, things of that nature. Um, they have a toxicity issue for pets, and they're right up on the list. Um, seventh came in our ACE inhibitors, like our Zestril and our Altase. Um, eight is our beta blockers. Um, nine is thyroid hormones. Um, and that's, you know, Synthroid, something that's very, very common. Um, and then 10, the cholesterol lowering agents, like our Lipitor, um, Crestor, Zocor, things of that nature. Um, they have different reactions, but the majority of them, you know, go to 
kidney and liver issue, kidney failure. Um, it can have heart issues, seizures, um, bone marrow suppression. The, the side effects from these different medications, you know, just go on and on and they're all very scary and very potentially dangerous for our pets. So, you know, they always recommend, you know, you never leave, um, never leave loose pills around. Um, try not to store your pills in, um, like plastic Ziploc bags things that are too easy for our pets to chew into. When you're having guests in the home or anything like that, make sure that, you know, they keep their pets, or I'm sorry, their medications away from the pets. Um, also place medications in, you know, higher up places, try to keep them out of sight. You can do the weekly pill containers that have, you know, everything separated, but make sure that it's in a container that is stored in a cabinet that cannot be, you know, if it's dropped, the top doesn't pop open, things of that nature, you know, try to go with, you know, the screw top lids. Never store your medications in the same cabinet as your pet's medications. It's so simple for somebody to misread something. You know, also talk to your veterinarian because a lot of times, you know, they can use different color bottles um, than you get in your pharmacy. Um, for example, we use big red bottles here in our office. So that way, you know, they're not like the amber or the yellow ones that they use in a regular pharmacy. So that way you can quickly identify, you know, what is the pet's, what's yours. And always remember that if you have an instance of a problem, you know, bring your pet to the vet immediately. If it's after hours, you know, call your emergency clinic. And if you're concerned, pet owners can always, you know, apply for that coverage with Pet Poison Helpline. You call, um, they will tell you exactly, you know, what you should be doing, if you should be inducing vomiting, or if you should go straight to a veterinarian. Um, they can tell you what the level that the pet ingested in the milligram dosage what signs you need to look for for toxicity, things of that nature. There is a fee, you know, with that call. The Pet Poison Helpline is not a free call. Um, their current fee price is $59. <coughs> Excuse me. However, you know, for the safety of your pet, that's a very small fee to be able to talk to somebody and find out exactly, you know, what's going to happen. So you can always go online petpoisonhelpline.com or call their 1-800 number that's in there, download the app, and just make sure that you're very, very cautious about the medications around your pets. You know, that's such great information because I remember two things. Uh, a few years ago, we had someone stay with us. Didn't think anything about it. They put their Tylenol on their nightstand and they didn't have the top closed. All the, you know how they have to push down and those they're childproof, but sometimes if you don't screw them, they're not pet proof so yeah we had a pet jump up on the bed and have some we the, knocked the thing over we weren't sure whether she ate any of it or not we called that hotline and they're so so helpful and guided us we ended up going to our vet but um those are things that people don't think of you have to make sure you let your guests know we have you know we have dogs in the house or cats in the house so make sure that you're um that they're kept high up and that they keep them screwed really really tight and another thing is you brought up the hormones. Sometimes women get those hormones that they put into a cream in their arm or wherever. And I was told by someone years ago that the animal can come into contact with that and it can be absorbed. You have to make sure that you have something covering it or that you don't hold the animal for a while while you're taking those because this, the hormones can get transferred to the animals. Have you ever heard of that? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a transdermal effect, same as with you. You know, if it's going through your skin and being absorbed by the body, then the same thing can happen to them. So yes, definitely being cautious. You know, the other thing I see too is, you know, in some of our um, elderly patients, you know, even like the Tylenols that are in the childproof caps, they have such a hard time getting them open that when they do, it's like the stuff flies. You know what I mean? They're putting so much pressure into trying to get that lid off. So always be really cautious. And if you have to put it, you know, a lot of times, and people don't always know this, but like in ours, we have the childproof um, lids on those pres prescription bottles. But these, when you take the lid off, the childproof top, it actually flips over and it's double-sided. So you can screw it back on if you have a hard time with the childproof portion. So if you're struggling with that and you screw it on and off, then that sometimes is easier for, you know, our elderly patients to get the medication out because we get that in with their pets. Even if the patient, um, you know, needs a medication, it has to be to where the pet owner has to be able to get into it. 
And if they have a hard time with their hands, you know, that's why we use the screw lids on the opposite side. So that way, you know, it's screwed in tight. The pet, you know, is not going to be able to screw that off without a lot of work. And then the owner is able to get into it without having them, you know, fly all over when they have to put force on to use the childproof cap. That's such great information. And this is really so important. And I think sometimes people don't really think about it. But, you know, if you're having guests come and stay at your house, please make your guests be aware of this. You be aware of it. Sometimes we don't even think of things like this. And then um, there's just a lot of information that you can get from the uh, Pet Poison Helpline, too, in that app. It's really important to have that app downloaded. So, Monica, as always, I thank you very much. It's great information. Thank you so much. Have a great week. Coming up, have you ever thought of starting your own rescue? There are some things you should know before you start. That's what's next. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Pick up two bottles of Licko Chops, get the third bottle free. New improved Licko Chops with omega-6, omega-3, vitamin E, and now six extra direct-fed microbials. Even better for the digestive tract and immune system. And dogs love it. Try Licko Chops. Buy two, get one free. This is Henry Lukasiewicz for Dynavite. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back, everyone. You know, with approximately six and a half million companion animals going into U.S. shelters each year, which is astonishing. And then approximately one and a half million are being euthanized each year. Shelters and rescues are needed so much right now and out there to help the animal now more than ever. Well, we have someone with us, Sandra Fow England, and she's a nonprofit attorney and author who has provided legal counsel for nonprofit groups for over 20 years. Sandra is also the founder of Renosi, a company that helps nonprofit groups manage the federal and state filing requirements needed to obtain and maintain tax exempt status. And Sandra is also the author of a book which I found to be so inspiring and very easy to read, and and it has a lot in it. It's Rescue Me, Your Step-by-Step Guide to Starting an Animal Rescue, and it's a book that's packed with valuable, common sense, and practical points without all of that legalese. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sandra Fowl England to the Dougie Diva Show. Well, great. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. No, I really loved your book as someone who's been in rescue for many, many years. I learned from it. It's, you know, you had a lot of information in there and it's very, for the complexity of what it takes to have a successful uh, rescue or shelter and whether it's someone who's looking to start one or someone who's doing it already, this is very easy and comprehensive to read and to understand. But, you know, I've, I've spent my career trying to simplify the law, just as sort of a down-to-earth person and said, let's try to make these things easier. Um, and that said, the laws with respect to nonprofit groups, starting them up and keeping them exempt, um, tend to get more and more complicated as the years have gone by um, since I've been practicing in this area. So with my own two fur babies by my <laughs> side, I decided, you know what, I need to make this as easy as possible so more people can, can do their, live their dream and start a, start a rescue or really another nonprofit. We're talking about rescues today and make the world a little better place for us. Well, as we're, you know, we're talking today about rescue, but you have a really extensive background. Can you please tell the listeners about your background? Well, I've been a, an attorney and always working with tax events organizations for, we'll just say over 20 years. I'm, I'm now letting the gray hair show. So I just like <laughs> caught on the cup of hair, right? So, and I have always represented tax exempt organizations, both helping them get set up and then um, also doing ongoing, you know, legal conference for them. And when I got my dog, I think it was uh, seven years ago now. Well, these are actually teenage dogs, uh, not teenage, teenage pleading. Mom, can't we have a dog? Mm-hmm. Sure, if you take care of them. And now they're on and live in their own houses and the dogs live with us. So, <laughs> Isn't that how it's supposed to work? I don't know. 
You know, it always does, but I thought, sure, it would be different for me because we had the talk, right? No, no different. <laughs> I couldn't see my little Stella go. She's the one that sits beside me. But I just know that people that start nonprofit groups have a passion for what they what they do, but they, of course, wouldn't have experience and background in all the federal and state laws it takes to, to get the groups going and, and keep them going. Um, in 2016, the IRS granted 80,000 new tax exemptions. That sounds wonderful. And they revoked 50,000 other groups because the, they're volunteer run or they're run by people who are passionate about their cause but don't know what they need to do to keep their exemption. So um, that's why I started Renosi and I'm writing the books to try to help people so that they can go out there and keep doing good work and not suffer through IRS regulations. You know, I, for one, you know, having been in rescue for many years, I mean, I appreciated the book and I have like so many stickies in it. I'm, you know, looking as I was reading, I'm going, oh my gosh, I didn't know this. Oh my gosh, this is so important. What, what was your inspiration for like putting it into, because you're an attorney, what was it to put it into this language that, you know, the average person such as myself, I mean, I could understand everything in the book. I didn't have to run and like, like Google anything. I mean, it was right there. <laughs> Maybe it means I'm a simple person myself. <laughs> I yeah, I was really lucky. I was thinking about that because I'm, in fact, I'm going to see my mother today and I'm giving her a copy of the book. She doesn't have her own copy yet. It just came out in November. And, and um, it, you know, thanks to my parents who taught me to write. I don't think people know how to write, but also, you know, these days our students in schools and all, I aren't really focused on that. And, um, but I always want to make it easy. I, I, I went to a, a big name law school, but the, I was a Midwest girl from Ohio and just felt like, you know, we don't have to um, put things in complicated terms for ordinary people to understand. You know, and lots of people also think if you put it all down in a book, no one will ever need your services, but that's not the case either. You know, some people want to do it themselves. Some people want help to to get their group started and maintain their organizations. So um, I'm just all about you write it down, you get back to society, and society will get back to you. You know, I kind of beg to differ because I think with a book like this that people would be in contact with you because you speak, you know, you speak our language, you really get it, and there's information in here that you, you have things that are state by state. You have fabulous templates for different things. I mean, uh, even for myself, one of the things that I didn't even know about was, I guess I knew about it, but I never really thought about it, is this pet flipping. I mean, you're, you have so much in your book, you cover so much, but the pet flipping, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that if people actually hear about what goes on, they may be looking at things a little closer, you know, when they adopt out their pets. Well, sure. And, you know, first, like, as any good attorney, we got to have a disclaimer in there. And my expertise is in the, the nonprofit tax area. And there are other attorneys who practice, you know, specifically with animal law. And it is a growing body of law. So don't want anybody to think that I consider myself an animal law expert, except to the extent that I pulled it all together for this book. But apparently, and I learned it as I was writing the book as well, folks will go and either, you know, adopt an animal or they'll, um, and then they'll go ahead and sell the animal once they've adopted it. So they will, they will, you know, get one from a rescue or a shelter for um, very little money or just a donation or, you know, however that shelter is set up. And then they turn around and sell uh, the animal. And the, it's very difficult still today to try to enforce certain agreements. I, I gave a lot of templates. In fact, I think you, know, you probably noticed the book is probably two-thirds appendix and one-third check because I wanted to make it practical to be able to do this stuff. Um, but animals are still, for the most part, considered property. They're not. And so mm -hmm. as property, whoever has possession generally has the greatest right to that animal. And so I do talk about that in there, and I provide some sample contracts and ways to write this to try to tighten down your, your programs when you're setting up a shelter or a rescue. Um, and those laws are changing. I'm sure there's going to be, you know, addition to of this book because there are a few jurisdictions um, and a growing number that are starting to look at the, the best interests of an animal um, when there may be a, a divorce or a, some other separation of people who co-own an animal. A few courts are now looking at that. So that whole animal as property is changing a little bit now to more you know, as I say, not really a, a human, but, you know, but the same sort of standard as we look at for children when we have a, a separation or divorce situation. Um, and that may help also with the pet flipping and the other 
um, activities that go on, which is not the intent, of course. We want people to understand that it's a forever home that they're taking this animal for, not, you know. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And that's why some of the things that you have in here are very uh, informative, even for the experienced rescuer. I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that you bring up that are, you know, not only, and I'm not talking in a legal manner, just like eye-opening. And and you know what else? I really like the way you laid out, this is in your text, because what you do is you give the information and then you hit the bullet points in the back of each chapter. I thought that that was really good. Well, you know, some of us have more time and some of us have less, right? Mm-hmm. And and um, uh, highlighting the, I know me, I'm not a, uh, I write books, but I'm not the reader. The hus- My husband is the reader in the family and has to start listening to volumes. <laughs> I guess it's because I'm writing them and reading contracts all day. That, um, so I wanted to make it just as simple to you. So people, um, and you're right, and it's not just for people setting up a rescue. It's also for people who are running mm-hmm. um, any kind of shelter or rescue so that they have the resources for the different types of contracts and the state-by-state laws and the, you know, the bullet points on what they should be doing or not doing with respect to fundraising. Um, so it is intended to become a sort of a resource guide. Uh, my first book, uh, this is the School Booster Club. I know a woman has it by her nightstand, and she calls it the, the School Booster Club Bible and takes it everything she goes to. And, and that's my hope, is that people will use it as a resource um, as much as, you know, it's not a pleasure reading books so much to sit down and uh, tell a good story. Well, and you can find so much in it. And I think that some t- you, you touched on something, fundraising. Sometimes people become overwhelmed with, you know, oh, we're going to be doing fundraising or, you know, they're looking for the right way to do things. And, and you go through um, that in the book, too. I mean, you, go, you kind of hit on everything. I'm sure I missed something. But in fact, I hope your listeners out there and people that get the book will tell me, because if I miss something, we'll put that in addition to, you know, something they've always struggled with. And the other thing we're planning to do starting in um, 2018 is to even have an online course. So for people who want to set up a nonprofit and want to make sure sort of the, the quick Kickstarter kind of program where they can come through and, you know, we'll have the eight sessions so that they know for sure that they're doing fundraising rights and, and managing the board of directors and so forth, because it's a lot to take in and to understand and, and get going. And uh, I really want people to succeed. Um, Definitely. And I'm so happy that you brought that up because that was one of my questions. I was going to ask if you've ever considered doing an online course on this, because I think that people would, um, you know, who, who, want to be in rescue or who are currently in it would love to be a part of that. Yeah, we're, you know, it's, I'm working with uh, my, my team here to, to pull it all together. I've, I've been an attorney for well over 20 years. So I've done so many webinars and so much material and trying to go through it and figure out, you know, what are the eight key points and even having maybe a focus group, you know, the people that are taking it together, cohorts of 10 people or whatever, so we can learn from each other and, uh, but really know all the finer parts points. And I know for me, if I don't go to my yoga class, I'm unlikely to do my yoga here at home, right? And if you have a class, it sort of pushes you through and mm-hmm. makes sure that you cover all the points that you need to know. Can you provide us with some of the steps that you recommend to start a rescue? Well, a- absolutely. I think I, I talk about it as a as a five step, but the, the first step really is to decide what you want your rescue to do. And one of the key points I make in this book is to niche your rescue. Um, and, and you get more support that way, um, both probably from volunteers, financial, and even folks knowing about your rescue. And what I mean by that is um, you could start, you know, a cat rescue, but you, or you could start a fostering, pro- temporary fostering program for women going through breast cancer treatment, you know, who can't take care of their, their animals. And if you do, you know, niche it, you pick your, your type of animal, your community you're serving, and exactly what you're going to do, you're not only going to reach people who are, are love of animals, but you're going to reach that community. You're going to reach the, the veterans or the, the people having a particular health issue and so forth. So that's the first step, as I say, is really step back and think about what you're passionate about. Then you need to gather your pack is how I call it. And that is because you need to have, um, to get taxes and status, a board of directors. And so your pack begins with that board. And I suggest you need three to five people that can't all be your relatives uh, to who will be the guiding force, who will approve your budgets every year and uh, and that sort of thing. You're also going to have to gather your volunteers in a big group, but that's part of your pack. Then you got to set it all up. 
So we suggest, you know, incorporation, that's some liability protection and getting your tax exempt status, and we go through exactly how to do that. Um, and once you're set up, you got to go out there and raise support. You know, as we all know, if we don't bring in more money than it costs to run, we won't be around mm-hmm. very long. So we talked about raising support. And then finally, I talked a little bit about understanding uh, risk management, how to cover your risks with insurance and uh, by changing the way you operate and, and some other things. So those are the five steps I recommend in the book um, to sort of get you going. Well, and they're very valuable and they're very well thought out. And Ty, what do you see as the biggest areas of opportunities for someone who wants to start a rescue? You know, it goes back to what I said at first, the whole niching. We, I think that the rescue world and shelter world is growing up a bit. Um, but they're also now, I was reading, I think 70% of U.S. households now have animals. Mm-hmm. And we know what that means is that there's going to be more animal surrender because folks find out that they can't take care of them or didn't know what it took. And picking a niche that really follows those kinds of trends. I was reading recently about chicken rescues because the backyard chicken movement yes. and people decide that they're going to take on chickens and then decide, oops, I really don't want to. Not going to work. Yeah. Week. So this is the growing size of, of animals and then those, those, those niches and really targeting that because you're going to get that much more interest. So I think that is the, um, the that is the real key uh, right now is it really in any small business, but um, also in rescues and shelters, just figure out that, that niche or where you're going with it because there certainly are enough animals out there of all different types uh, that need our help. One of the things you talk about, too, is you also, I, I talked about the templates in the back, and, and they are just guidelines and educational. But, I mean, you have the templates on animal surrender, foster care agreements, shelter rescue cooperative agreement, volunteer agreement, adoption agreement, span neuter agreement. Those are all so valuable and so important. And, and I'm not sure that everybody has all of those, and that's these um these templates you created really are something that, someone who's looking to start, maybe they don't know where to start. This is a great, um, this is a great tool so that they'll go, Oh, okay. What my volunteers, I'll do this. Oh, when I foster out a pet, I could do that. I mean, I thought that that was very, uh, well thought out. And they're on our website too. My, my author website was my name, com. Um, you can find all of these resources that are in the back and download them and so forth. There's a, there's a code in the book. It's a simple code, but, um, to so you can actually download the form. Because again, I'm all about making it simple and making it practical. I get that from my mother. I think so. <laughs> practicality is is you know that's what we that's what we learned there in Ohio where I grew up. So these are all out on the as I say on the author website as well. All of those templates. And yeah, we have to say they're educational because as we know with by the state by state laws that are in there, state animal laws, state contract laws, all of those things vary. Um, and I'm certainly not licensed in all 50 states. Um, but they give you a starter, at least, to know what you need to be looking at, what kind of provisions you should put in a, a fostering agreement, how do you try to prevent that flipping that we talked mm-hmm. about before. A lot of, you know, a contract is, is important legal provisions, but I always look at this stuff as it's, it's educational for who you're using it with as much as anything else. You know, you're telling them, we expect you to get the animal spayed or neutered if it's not done at the shelter and we, you know, you need to, to do these things and it's forever home and if you don't can't take care of the animal, bring them back or whatever it is you have in there. It is a contract, but it's also it's an educational device and that's why you want those contracts written with as little legalese as possible either because it's just ordinary, everyday people are reading these. You want them to understand what they're reading and what they're agreeing to. Absolutely. And it and also, you touched on this, um, the state-by-state state laws. You provide the laws for all of the states. I mean, that, I mean, even in the state I lived in, I looked at a couple and I said, oh, my. Because I, I think that probably we're familiar with some things, but we're not familiar with all things. So you went state-by-state state and just laid everything out. And I have to give some kudos to, um, I think, it's Michigan State, where they have an animal law center. Uh, and they don't have them laid out this way, but they have a tremendous resource of animal laws throughout the country. And so it was certainly very useful to us as we were trying to pull this together. I'll give a shout out to my assistant, Kathy. I mean, it takes a team to pull a book together. And I had a team of people helping me get it, you know, get these laws all pulled in there, getting them formatted. And, and hopefully there aren't too many, you know, 
trying to get them consistently formatted. But state laws will change as well. As I mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, animals are now in some jurisdictions not being looked at um, as property uh, as much as they used to. So, so these are going to change as well, but it gives you at least a good handle on the different types of, of laws. I mean, dangerous dogs. Uh, laws and breed specific laws and we know um, in the animal world that those are going away but they still exist in some you mm-hmm. know places so I think it gives you a good handle on all the different kinds of things that you need to be concerned about but then I say I don't want people to be worried right I mean it's a resource so that because um, I don't want to dissuade people from starting because there's a lot of uh, information it's just you need to have it at your fingertips and know when and where to look it up. Well, I'm a firm believer in knowledge is power because there's something that, you know, you don't ever want to go into anything, whether it be rescue or anything, without knowing, you know, what consequences are or the how to lay a good groundwork. And I think that that's what this does. It sort of teaches um, or enlightens the person so that they could lay a great groundwork getting into it. And it and it sort of opens their eyes as to things that, yes, I, I have to remember to do this, or this is a great idea. I'm going to focus on that. So, I mean, the way you laid it out, I think it helps to lay the groundwork for someone who, again, is thinking of starting a rescue. And Lord knows in this you know, this day, um, it's important because there are so many uh, surrendered pets and pets being euthanized. So it's so important to start a rescue and to have that rescue work for them or for the person who's a seasoned person and in the administration and who wants to learn more. I mean, that's why I'm very excited that you're going to have online classes. I think that it's going to be wonderful for the people out there that are, as I said, looking to get into it or who are already in it. Yeah, you know, and people often think of nonprofits uh, that they're not, they don't think of them as businesses as much. You know, they think mm-hmm. of them uh, as a, a passion and a way to make the world better, and it is all of that. Uh, but the bottom line is it, it's, it's a business as well. By, the, by that, there's regulations you have to follow. There's, you know, you've you got to raise money, you know, more money than you spend. There's, you know, there's, you got to budget every year. There's just all these things you have to do that are like any other business. But as we all may know or may not know people who are so committed to some sort of nonprofit and rescue a shelter um, any other kind of nonprofit they're passionate about that and they're not considering themselves business people so they you know often will need that, those guidelines or or you know a book or a resource to tell them but it is a business so let's step back and figure out what we need to do to make sure we're we're running it all you know Legally, you don't need a black eye and, and lose your support because you failed to file, you know, your IRS tax return exactly. for the year. Yeah, no, and that's why you when, when you lay out things like that, sometimes people going into it, they may have an idea, like you talked about passionately how to start it and have an idea, maybe if they volunteered someplace, what to do, but you lay it out so that, um, you know, tax-wise, budget-wise, um, you know, we talk about fundraisers, different things like that and different laws state by state that people, you even talk about the transportation and things like that because pets are trans- sometimes transported from one rescue or shelter to another and it may be in another state. So, I mean, there's so much that's in the book um, fostering the different things that go into, of course, I'm a foster failure, but um, the different things that go into <laughs> fostering <laughs> that, that I think that sometimes people don't even realize. Well, I could, you know, when I first started writing the book, I was, as I say, I'm an, I, my specialty is in the areas of, of nonprofits and setting them up and managing them, but all those transportation laws, and we know those all came into effect this year with all of the natural disasters we had in Texas and in Florida, mm-hmm. and animals had to be taken to, to other states to, um, so they had to be taken care of and, and adopted out or fostered and so forth, and, and those are, laws are fairly they're just so different from every state to state, whether you have to have quarantine or what kind of vaccinations mm-hmm. and what kind of paperwork you have to show. Um, and there's cases in the book also. And, and again, it's not written like a, a legal textbook, but it shows different cases where, you know, neglect charges are brought or whatever, or where they weren't transported correctly. And, and so it, it just helps give you a good idea, uh, particularly if that's an area you're thinking about going into, you know, like I'm going to niche in, in, transporting animals instead of, you know, setting up a, a shelter myself. Um, and if you are going to set up, set up a shelter, it talks about the zoning laws. I thought it was interesting um, that, you know, if if you think the zoning laws may change, you may end up having to move your a shelter because it's not really 
typically grandfathered in. Or people can bring nuisance complaints against you if you have too many animals or they're barking too loudly or, you know, so forth. And all those kind of cases are, are sort of talked about here in a story-like way so you understand what kind of things go on and, and how to set yours up so you don't run into those issues. And, and they're very realistic. And for the the listeners out there who want to learn more about you, who want to learn more about uh, your book, Rescue Me, your step-by-step guide to starting an animal rescue, where could they go? Well, you can get the book on Amazon.com like everything else in this world, right? So <laughs> you can get it either in digital or in paperback. If you want to know more about me, my other book, courses, that sort of thing, um, you can go out to my, my website, which is Sandra Fowl England, and that's spelled S-A-N-D-R-A, P as in Paul, F as in Frank, A-U, England, E-N-G-L-U-N-D. But I have that's my author website. It's also linked on the Amazon page. Or you can go to MyRenosi, which is M-Y-R-E-N-O-S-I dot com. And that's our, our nonprofit registration uh, business that also, and they all link back and forth. So you can find out more information about me, the book, the services we offer. Um, and they can also just email me, Sandy at MyRenosi dot com. If you have questions, if there's other things you'd like to see in the book, I am always happy to get email and to, to respond. Well, I'm so glad that, that I got to read your book. I'm so glad I got to meet you. And since this is our first show of 2018, I felt what better way to start than for people who are, everyone has their things that they want to do, you know, going into the, the new year. And maybe someone, maybe there's people out there who are looking to start a rescue or are looking to make changes within the rescue. I thought this would be such a perfect book for them. And also the fact that you're going to be offering online courses is so inspirational. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to ask you is, when you do decide to do that, would you come back on our show so we could talk about it? Absolutely. I'd be delighted. I think that that's wonderful. And I, and I want to thank you, Sandra, for all that you're doing for the animals and for all that you're doing for people in rescue or people who are looking to get into rescue. Um, I appreciate everything. And I, myself, who have been in it for quite a few years, learned a lot in your book. So I'm sure that everyone will uh, will want to read it who is looking to get into rescue, who is in rescue, or who just is an animal person, because there's a lot of information in here that is just good for the pet owner, potential pet owner, or someone who just wants to learn more about this. This is so interesting. And so in this time in our lives, I think it's very necessary to have this. Well, thank you so much for, for your kind words and having me on, on your show, but also everything you're doing oh, um, thank in the you. animal world. Happy New Year, and I'm looking forward to having you back on. We'll talk about those classes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. Hi, Doggy Diva Show listeners. Susan Marie here to take just a half a minute to let you know how much we appreciate your being with us every week to hear great dog tips you can use with your pet, some great stories about rescues, fostering, and some heartwarming stories about second chances for pets who are now in loving forever homes. Be sure to go to our website, thedoggydiva.com, to see pictures of Miss Olive and other dogs we talk about on the show and get to know us a little better. That's thedoggydiva.com, D-O-G-G-Y. We appreciate your feedback, too. Okay, let's get back to the show. Coming up, how to best choose a groomer for your pets and you. Stay with us. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome.
Welcome back, everyone. We have with us today award-winning veterinarian Dr. Michael Reinhardt from Venice, Florida. Hey, Dr. Reinhardt, how are you? Well, I'm doing just fine. And yourself? Very well, thanks. Uh, you know what I want to ask you about? There's some. There's a lot going on around the internet, and it's been all over the news nationally. Uh, there was um, a groomer who allegedly had injured some dogs that were groomed. I think one dog may have had a, a jaw issue, and another one. It was on video of her shaking the dog. So I know people have been asking me what. What do I know about it? What could I do about it? You know, what can people do about it? Or how should they know if their groomer is good? And I think that most people trust their groomer. I had one for my cat who I loved. She was so good to her. But um, there were other ones that were not. So how, what, what can you do to kind of look for in your pet when the pet comes from the groomer, I guess, is what we need to know. Well, this is a pretty difficult situation. I mean, what occurred was really remarkable that this was even happening but it does it does and and i mean okay the reality is you're doing something to a pet that doesn't want you doing this to the pet some pets don't react very difficultly and some pets become very dangerous to you and everybody that's around you and trying to do this stuff so you have to make a decision should i proceed with this or can i just not do this uh do in my situation when i have issues it's like uh, I, I the only way i can do this with this particular patient is i have to tranquilize them or knock them out and i just did that i had an x-ray and the animal was not going to allow us to do this without fighting us so much and we just knocked them out and we took it but they don't have the ability to do that. Uh, the groomers don't really have the ability, legally have the ability to do that. Um, but, you know, from what do you look for? It's kind of a hide-and-seek thing because you, you, you come in and leave them there and you walk out and you don't know what's going on. And see. But, I mean, look for things. So, like, is the grooming table near a window where there's some visibility for what's really happening here? Or is it way back in the back and all closed in and you really can't see what's going on? And most likely the latter is the case and not the former because they might have several places that they do the grooming and most of them are probably back in the back of a, of a room the other thing is if you're there when they put them on the table they usually trust them up they usually put something on them to keep them in one place but the question is and also when you're there and you're looking around are there animals that are trussed up and and strapped up on the table that are left there and nobody's there next to them uh because those animals, if nobody's there, could decide they're going to jump to try and break free, and they can wind up hanging themselves. So if there's no real situation where you think they are observing your your pet when they're doing what they're doing, and they're just leaving them there and walking away and coming back later, that to me would be a concern. Because the pet doesn't want to be there, and as soon as he sees an opening, he's going to jump, and he's and he's got he's got all these lanyards around him that's going to stop him from doing that. The other thing would be, and this is difficult... Do you have a difference in your animal's mentation or his his the way he reacts to you when he comes back uh, that might show you he's having issues? One issue that you look for is you go to pet him and he puts his head down like maybe he got hit in the head and he's trying to drop that. But the reality is these animals are going to get wired up because they're there, so they may react to you differently when they come back anyway because they were there and not because somebody did anything to them, but, uh, you know if somebody shook them and caused a problem, one of the problems that I would think could be happening is, okay, we might have a neck injury, a cervical vertebral neck injury, which is going to be something you're going to see that. The dog's not going to want to move his neck around very well. You go to move his neck back and forth, and he's really hindering to do that, or he's having pain, and or worse, you all of a sudden you see he's not bending his neck down to eat his food because he has pain when he bends his neck down. Okay, maybe somebody did something that caused trauma to the cervical spine. You know, and then I did I did see a picture of a ear that some woman's pet came back, and it was horrible. I mean, this ear was scarified, had all these scratches and blood and all this stuff inside this ear. Well, that's a, it's a lot more stringent than should have occurred to deal with this ear. I do understand that people that are doing these things are faced with problems with the way the pet's going to react. But you, as the person to deal with these animals, have to understand you either do this or you back off. You know, you, you have to say, I, I, I sorry, I, I really can't do this, okay? Um, because there's two issues here. There's your pet, which could be harmed, but there's also the people that are working with your pet that could be harmed, okay? So there's two people that could get hurt here. And, and unfortunately, when that happens, you as the pet owner need to understand that this may not be the angel you think it is under these circumstances. I mean, okay, they're home with you and all, they love, they sit, they, they jump in the bed and everything's fine, but you know what? When you get around stuff like this and or doctors, you may not have a cherub 
that you think you have, <laughs> okay? And you have to accept that and understand that, okay? And the problem is, okay, so why don't we tranquilize them to break them in? That's a fine statement, but you need to understand something. There's a moderatory situation going on in the brain of these pets and you that tells you what's right and what's wrong. It modulates your behavioral abilities. When I knock an animal out or I tranquilize an animal, I tranquilize that modulating format. So I take away their ability to figure out what's right or wrong, so they're going to overreact, and they're not going to react with knowing what's right or wrong. You have a higher chance of being bit by an animal that is tranquilized than an animal that is not because of that. And I tell all of my people that work for me when we have animals coming up from anesthesia, you know, leave them alone, let them come up, you go over, you try and pet them, anything else. That animal has a, may respond to that, you know, you scare them. And because the, the modulatory situation has been removed from the anesthesia, you have a higher chance of being bit from that point of view than that. So if you tranquilize them, could they work better with them? Maybe or maybe not. So don't think yet that drugs are the answer. <laughs> Well, and that's a good tip because I think sometimes, like we talked about, they're not really supposed to be using um, well, no, they aren't. tranquilizers. They, they shouldn't be, especially injectable tranquilizers. They, they do not have a license to use injectable tranquilizers. Oral tranquilizers, yeah, you could possibly use an oral tranquilizer, but they take so long to work. I mean, oral tranquilizers, I mean, they have to be absorbed and everything else. I mean, it's if I'm going to tranquilize, I'm going to do injectable, and they don't have a license to do that. So, But just look to see if an animal's left unattended. Uh, um, trust up, you know, but again, it's a hide and seek thing because there's a lot of stuff that go on behind the lines that you don't, I mean, that, 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 anybody that deals with animals has that problem. And I, I, I mean, there are practices where the client doesn't come back with the animal and the, or even talk, see the doctor, which I don't understand that because I need to talk to you for history to figure out what's going on and how can I figure this case out without talking to you who you know more what's happening than anything else. But, uh, for me, I want the client in the room because I want to talk to you and you want to see what we're doing. And I do have clients that, you know, when we're going to go to surgery, well, I want to be, and the clients are there. Like we're doing dentals and the, client wants, the client's there when we knock them out. So uh, we don't try and play hide and seek and stuff like that. But uh, the client needs to understand, if I tell you to move away, get away, okay? But you, you want to be here just to visualize this, that's fine, but don't get in my way. Well, I thank you very much, and um, one of my dogs did have a dental, and I was concerned, and you let me stand, and I watched, and everything was wonderful. See? So See? Yes, you did. There's I was no very, it was very, yes, but you're I, extremely... I understand concerned. that, because, That's what's important. because uh, I'm treating more than one thing here, okay? I'm treating your pet, but I also have to treat you, okay? And if you have an anxiety because of me... I have to deal with that. I ha I don't want that. And so, it, it, and I'm not hiding anything. So I don't have a problem as long as you're not telling me what to do or getting in my way. If you're going to be there and watch, I don't have a problem with that. No, my ex anxiety was over her being under sedation because she's so horrible. You, and you know which one I'm talking about. No, she's so, no, it was no, no idea at all. <laughs> all. All of us in this room know who it is. <laughs> and she's just extremely high strung and reacts to things in very bizarre ways. So, but no you, way. you said, let me, you come right back and look, and she's fine. And I was going, oh. But yeah, obviously one of the things you need to look for is transparency when you're, you're, you're taking your uh, pet to a groomer. Be able to ask questions. And if you do have anything that you feel uncomfortable with after leaving there, like I know that you said that um, there was a situation where somebody came to you with an ear situation. She had just come right from the groomer. So if you have any questions, contact your vet right away. I mean, and um, it may be the groomer. It may not be. It may be something else. But if you see something, if it looks out of character, if it's something that you don't feel comfortable with, call your vet right away and... Um, Take their advice and see what to do next. I mean, there are, there are probably more common things that occur that I see post-grooming is you get, like, razor burn. Uh, sometimes they'll get cuts, things like that. And that, okay, that doesn't necessarily mean the groomer is a problem because those things happen, okay? But those are things I anticipate post-groomer is, is, you know, they got the razor going a little bit too close or something and the heat from that caused the burn in the skin. Yeah, okay. And or when they're trimming and stuff like that, they actually clipped them and made a cut. Okay, fine. Sometimes you got to put a suture in. A lot of times you don't. Uh, some of you put them on antibiotics to keep them from getting infected. But those are more commonly seen things. Okay, somebody picking your dog up and shaking the heck out of it and causing a cervical injury, that's unacceptable. That's totally unacceptable. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, this is a pretty hot topic out there yeah. right now. And uh, I appreciate your lending your professional insight into this. I think it was really helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's good to see you. 
Always. <laughs> we would like to thank our guests this week. And also, as our doggy divas always say, please love your pets because they love you unconditionally. And please remember to adopt, foster, spay, neuter, and microchip. And as always, please have a great Diva Week, everyone. That's all for this episode of the Doggy Diva Show. To find out more, go to our website, thedoggydiva.com. Also, find us on our Facebook page, The Doggy Diva Show, and tell your fellow dog lovers about it. Don't miss Susan Marie, Miss Olive, and The Doggy Divas right here for the next episode. See you again soon. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.